Well, thank you for taking the time to speak with me about Hedwig Conrad Martius. Uh, and I guess uh, at the outset, um, how we should begin, I think, is um, while um, you and I both know how important she was to the early phenomenological movement, I think her name is one that's uh, rather forgotten or it's one that's not part of a lot of contemporary discussions of phenomenology. So I guess maybe the place to begin then is to explain how you see her importance in the phenomenological movement, tell us a little bit about who she was, uh, and then maybe tell us a bit about how you became acquainted with her ideas, because as a figure who's not well known, I mean, it's interesting how you came across her. Well, maybe um, the f this, maybe this should be the first thing to start with, mm -hmm. because uh, it was rather accidental how I met her, her met her work, her thinking. I, as just as so many meaningful things in life, I remember exactly the situation, exactly the, the way it happened. Mm -hmm. I was just submitted my PhD on Carl Jaspers and decided to focus on, uh, on Husserl's phenomenology. Mm -hmm. I was especially interested in the metaphysical elaboration of his phenomenology. And I simply went to the National Library, ordered the whole volumes of the Jahrbuch, mm -hmm. and just looked them one after the other. And my eyes fell on um, a treatise named Real Ontology. And I just started to read it. And it was kind of, uh, of um, was so interesting, so vivid, so uncommon way of philosophizing. Mm -hmm. And she, it was written by a name that I have never heard of, Hedwig Konrad Martius. I didn't know even uh, if it is a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. And I was looking this name in many entries, many lexicons. Most of them, the great majority of them, did not even mention her. Mm -hmm. And this was the start. This was the start. and. Uh, I um, decided, I just read this uh, book. Uh, it, I would say, far from being a piece of cake. It was very complicated, <laughs> have no similarities, so no resemble to anything that I have encountered before. And uh, then I just started to look for other books that she wrote, and I happened to, to find a few uh, just purchased them from Antique Vajaten and uh, I decided to uh, dedicate my postdoc in Minerva mm -hmm. to, to the study of her thinking and uh, of course during all this time I was wondering how, how come that at least all those figures that were in the in the Yabu of Husserl were known to me at least by their names. Mm -hmm. This name I have never heard, right. and I found her very deep, very rigor, very uh, um, surprising. The way the connection, the the, the synthesis that, that was whole different, as kind of uh, revealing a new a new land, a new territory that I was not uh, never met before. So uh, to make a very long story short, I, this was a start. I submitted, uh, um, submitted a proposal to Minerva. It was accepted. And I went to, uh, uh, went to many archives, libraries here in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say one of the most uh, important one was my visit in uh, Cologne. Mm -hmm. There I uh, met. Uh, there is a small archive, Husserl archive in mm -hmm. Cologne, and there I, uh, I was, uh, I met uh, quite accidentally Ruth Hagengruber, mm -hmm. and I cannot be sure if she actually mentioned the name Avel Almo, but she said there is a guy in Munich that worked with her, and you should meet him. Uh, for me, it was also uh, very important to see because in the archive there is a book that lists all the all the um, books that Husserl had his, in his library. So I was curious to see if he had some of her materials. And uh, then 
then I met, I came to, to Munich and I found uh, Avel Almo. And this was, uh, I think, one of the, I feel very lucky for this uh, opportunity. So maybe before we talk, you talk about the Minerva postdoc and about your relationship with Avel Almo. I think maybe because if people aren't aware of her, they're not going to know who he is either. Yes. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about, about her as a person before we talk about your yes. particular yes. Uh, Finding so, uh, Konrad Matius uh, is uh, quite often mentioned as the first woman in Germany to go to a grammar school, gymnasium, and to enter the university and write a dissertation. Uh, already during uh, her lifetime, she was, uh, she was described as the first lady in, uh, of the German philosophy. Uh, however, this is quite, quite misleading, this, uh, this description, because uh, basically uh, she did not uh, receive any acknowledgement of her work. Um, and uh, not only during her lifetime, but even nowadays, as we know, 50 years after her death, we just two years ago had this uh, uh, this anniversary of her 50 years of her, that she's still relatively unknown mm -hmm. and uh, even within f for for scholars that deal with phenomenology uh, did not hear about her name and um, so i think this has various reasons to mention the most uh, most clear ones is the first that she was actually I would say that when I look at her, all her, the timeline of her biography, the beginning seems to me very promising. Mm -hmm. She went to a grammar school. This was quite an, uh, an uncommon choice for, for girls then. Uh, she was born in Berlin in uh, 19, uh, 1888. And her parents uh, sent her to a grammar school. She, she grew up in Rostock and they then uh, just introduced a grammar school of the Helene Lenkchen uh, mm -hmm. in Berlin for girls. And it has its own uh, constraints, this place for her. Uh, it was very much focused on the grammar mm -hmm. and not on philosophy. And she, she, she writes about that. However, so, uh, of the 31 girls, the first that went, went to this uh, grammar school, only two uh, had managed finally to obtain the abitur. One of them was Konrad Matius. Mm -hmm. So this was a good start, quite an uncommon choice to send your daughter to, uh, to grammar school. And then uh, she moved to Munich. She could relate to her uh, philosophical interest. She attended the courses of Geiger and, and Lips and uh, they found her as a very interesting person, very talented. They recommended to her to move to, to Göttingen to attend Husserl's lectures. And she moved to Göttingen and then uh, she, she attended these lectures and she described it as a, as a first blitz in her philosophical life to listen to his uh, uh, seminar on the logical investigations. Soon she became uh, the, the chair of the society of uh, the Phenomenologen mm -hmm. from Munich and Göttingen. And, and then there was uh, that relatively known among scholars, that competition in the Faculty of Philosophy. And she submitted an essay and in 1912 she won the prize of this competition, so it seems that it's going, all is going very well. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I would say that uh, quite soon everything seems to go astray and think so many things were quite against her. Uh, maybe the first bad sign was the fact that she was, uh, she d they decided not to promote her despite the fact that she won this prize. Mm -hmm because they say the official argument was that she, her certificate from the, from the gymnasium did not include the Greek studies. Mm -hmm. So she had to move, move back to, Berlin, to uh, Munich and to work with uh, Fender, who was very supportive of her. He really appreciated her work. 
and he told her just take the first chapter of this this uh, essay on on that that won the prize. It was on the epistemological foundation of, of positivism. Mm -hmm. um, Husserl should be very satisfied from this uh, essay because it, it, in a way it really, really respond to his basic motives against psychologism. However, um, she did that and this was finally, she elaborated the big, I, I would say this is her first big book on the ontology of the external world, who published it in the third volume of the Jahrbuch. But then so many bad things happened. Uh, first of all, just to mention the most general circumstances, the like first half of the century, uh, 20th century, two world, which, I mean, this first half of the 20th century, this was the most creative period of her life. Mm -hmm. So there were two, World War, economic crisis, a cultural predicament, all this was very much hard for her. And then, uh, except for that, she was like so many outstanding women. She was a woman in a world of men. And this was, uh, it has many unequivocal consequences for her career. First of all, she, there was no, there were no enough offers possibilities for habilitation for women then, which means that she could not uh, have any position for teaching, and of course, let alone getting a, a permanent position in the university. Mm -hmm. And also she was a kind of a very, uh, you know, very um, honest person with herself. She would say what she believed, she did not, uh, she was not so much uh, paying attention to the specific politics. I'm not sure that she understood the, all this context, all those habits that there were there. And, and she criticizing, criticized the, the most, I would say, the author philosophical authorities of her time, which was Heidegger and Husserl. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a, an, un, for me, unforgettable postcard that Husserl sent her telling her that he is sorry, but he cannot accept her idea of phenomenology, mm -hmm. which is, uh, so this was, and beside all that, on top of it, uh, she was subjected to a publication ban uh, at 1933, quite, quite immediately after the Nazi took over, and this imposed so many restrictions. So I would say that except for the, this treatise that later became acknowledged as, as her dissertation and the, the first book on real ontology, which maybe we should refer to it later, all her, what she wrote was basically the great majority was written to the drawer. Mm. And this is, uh, I would say, both uh, the power of marginality and also the, the price that she paid for that because she kind of created her own private world of philosophizing and explored kind of a way of discussing ideas with herself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so she can be very original, very to take things in, a, in her own path. But at the same time, she was not understood by her contemporaries and later, and this is, so you've mentioned the real ontology a couple of times and uh, hinted at the idea that Husserl didn't uh, accept her version of phenomenology and also pointing out that Husserl and Heidegger are kind of her uh, philosophical opponents in some sort of way. Um, can you tell us just a little bit, you know, very, very briefly about uh, the real ontology and what her version of phenomenology is? Well, real ontology is, uh, I think, uh, rightly uh, considered as her magnum opus. Um, but uh, I think that this has to do because, um, first of all, this book, the, the, the section that was published in the Jahrbuch is just two of the five sections of the book. Mm -hmm. The rest three sections were not published, and uh, never. Still, until nowadays. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, just part of the book. I would say the most uh, essential part, but still it's just part of this book. 
and uh, she explored many times to, um, she tried, um, she had many ideas how to explore it, how to continue it, how to revise it. And there are in the archive stores at least stored at least two versions of the book and many appendixes that she considered to, to add to it. But all this never happened mm -hmm. because Husserl was not ready anymore to publish uh, the, the entire book. Also, as we know from the letters the ex exchange with the Reinach and others, this was also almost not happened, did not happen that this, the part what, that was finally published because he was not satisfied with her work. I, 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 don't, I don't think that he really knew, he really paid attention to how much profound and radical is her criticism of, her, of his philosophy by this first two sections. But anyway, so uh, I think this, this book, this, this contains this book, her very important, I, I would say, the fundamental idea of what is reality all about. And uh, I would say that this is indeed the basic for, basis, I, I would see the first layer of everything that she later would discuss and would work on. To make a very long sto sorry, story and complicated way of thinking short, she has the idea, first of all, unlike Husserl, uh, who in her view, and not only in her view, but also of the Munich circle of which he was part and a very prominent figure in this uh, circle, he was, uh, they, they, they were very much disappointed by what they considered as, he, as his kind of betray of, of, of his primordial original path in logical investigation, which they understood as something which is realistically oriented. Uh, they were very much uh, supportive of his attack of uh, uh, psychologism. And, uh, and then they, they regard the, the turn that happened in the first volume of ideas as kind of, of giving up the, the achievements that were already there in the logical investigation. I think it is not that unequivocal what is, if Husserl was really realist then, or he was completely idealist mm -hmm. from uh, ideas one. Now we know that and we have more, more manuscript published and more uh, research on that. But then it was kind of un something that they could not understand how he did that. So for her, the most, as a response to Husserl, the most important philosophical foundational difference is between the existing thing and the non-existing thing. And she, uh, she uh, uh, presented it as something which in reaction to Husserl or the idealistic, her view of idealism as the difference between the ideal and the non-ideal or the ideal or the real. For her, the only genuine philosophical difference is between the existing thing and the non-existing thing. And from this difference, she derived all her consequences. Mm -hmm. So I think she, then she employs very Aristotelian uh, concept to understand her, her reality. For me, I would say the most uh, inspiring um, idea uh, is the structure that, that she decipher in reality, which is composed of two aspects. One is the the, the what or the essence, uh, which is loaded, uploaded on the bearer that carries it. And in my view, uh, and she says that her, her study in real ontology, it is uh, dedicated to the, to the moment, not a timely moment, but a moment, a philosophical moment, uh, I would say abstract moment in which things elevate themselves from nothingness, but not yet arrive to be a real concrete being. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the minute in which things happen. And I think that exactly between the space of, between that essence and its uploading on a bearer, this uh, lies the entire poetic of her thinking that is not, uh, um, does not, despite being realist and insisting on the, the difference between the real and the, the, uh, the non-real, still did, does not equate the real with the concrete. 
but still see that the real contains within itself so many abstract aspects and nevertheless insisting that this is a realistic view. This is somehow just changes the map, mm -hmm. the, the regular map that divides be between idealism and realism. She just changes the map and I think her, exactly as Husserl was uh, spent <laughs> quite long part of his life to understand what is the, uh, the, the, the move from the first uh, stage of the reduction to the second stage, Exactly for her, it was uh, very much uh, uh, something that she was, I would say, pressing. What, ha what happened to the thing before it becomes to be concrete? What are the processes and, and the aspects that are involved in something to become real? And these were for her the most essential things in philosophy. Hmm, hmm. So I think, you know, I, I, I almost want to ask sort of too, having, you know, anyone who's familiar with the real ontology or her early work on time, um, or even just the first part of the real ontology where she, you know, she begins with the question of the meaning of, of being in a sense, there's obviously room to speculate that maybe she was an important influence on, on Heidegger. Uh, but instead of going down that route, um, I want to go back now to uh, your uh, Minerva postdoc and your, um, introduction to Eberhard Evel Alamont and, um, and what was your relationship with him and maybe, maybe just elaborate a little bit more on I mean, who he was and why he's so uh, important to the scholarship on Conrad Martius. I would, this is a very important question. Thank you for this question because I think this is among so much unluck in her, in her life, this was a really a, a moment of luck that she met him. Um, I worked, I was, I, I lived in Munich for a few months and uh, I was working with him daily, about eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. I think he's one of the most uh, erudite and um, generous person I have ever met. He was ready to share with me all he knew about her. He was so much excited that people are interested in her work. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were working every day and he shared with me uh, the consideration he took, we had when he, he edited her three volumes. He was also knew about the circumstances of each article. Basically, these are not genuine books. He collected different articles, different essays and, com and created books. And he also uh, was talking about uh, there are things that he is happy, happy that he included in these volumes and things that he regret that he did not include. Mm -hmm. And all his considerations and also his view of Conrad Matthews. Uh, by the end of the day, this guy was wrote his dissertation, his dissertation on, on Conrad Matthews. Mm -hmm. And then his habilitation was on the Munich uh, Göttingen phenomenology vis-à-vis -vis the G phenomenology of Freiburg. And later, his permanent position was to be a curator for the, of the Nachlass of the entire Munich circle. So he, 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 he was kind of an archive by, by himself. Mm -hmm. He knew almost everything about this group. And uh, he confirmed my uh, first then impression that Conrad Matus was by far outstanding figure among the other figures of this circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he not only, uh, not only um, admired her, but he actually dedicated his life to her work. And I can tell that I happened to, to participate in the funeral of his wife. And for me, it was unforgettable the fact that near the grave of his wife, he was talking about the two big wife in his life, Konrad Martius and his wife, uh, uh, Ursula Gottstein. Mm -hmm. And he, he, she, she, he, she, he became just, she was part of his life. He was excited about everything that connected to her. He had many manuscripts that he shared with me with no, just everything he could give me, he gave me. And it was really, uh, and he was so kind. I think his work is still basically historical. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that every work on any of the figures of the Munich Circle should and will relate to his work on, 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 on this, this figure. Because he, he, 
he knew, I think he kind of knew the most, the comprehensive context of this, of this group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also he was a very kind person, very happy to, he was excited that somebody is, is working on her work as if it, it is his. Mm -hmm. right. He was so happy about that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ronnie. We don't have to discuss anything more. <laughs>